We've got to hasten, but let's go to Acts chapter 23. Real quickly, just a reminder, the Apostle Paul, we've been going through the book of Acts, and I don't have time to go through the history of it. However, Acts is a time where Jesus goes up, his spirit comes down, his people go out. And that's kind of the story of the book of Acts. And, and when people go out to win people to Christ, problems come in. Sometimes they're a form of people, and sometimes they're a form of satanic attack. And certainly that's the case. Anytime there's movement, there'll be friction. When you try to do something for God, you're going to have some friction. You try to get someone saved, it's going to have some opposition. You say, well, I've never had any opposition. You're not serving the Lord. <laughs> you're not getting people the gospel. Anytime someone is aggressive about the things of God, you're going to have some satanic opposition. At the same time, that's followed by God's wonderful presence and his omnipotence. He is going to help you. And that is the story today in Acts chapter 23. Apostle Paul has come back to Jerusalem. He has submitted himself to what I believe to be a weak, a weakened local church in Jerusalem. They have, they have asked him to go a part of a, of a little bit of a plan to show his submission and his loyalty to the Jewish nation by taking a vow, taking his hair off, shaving his head, walking around in white, uh, white uh, outfits and uh, telling people that he is identifying with these other men who've taken a vow. After he is there for seven days, uh, he, is, um, he is accosted and uh, taken physically by some Asian Jews who saw him in Ephesus. And they begin to get him. They begin, help, guys, help. This guy is a heretic. And they accused him of bringing a Gentile man into the temple, which he did not do. That's not true. They said that he brought a guy named Trophimus into the temple. But they just were, they got a mob together. And the mob grabbed him and they pulled him out. It got the attention of the local police department and the chief captain, Claudius Lysias, was in charge of it. And he sent his soldiers down to rescue Paul from being stoned and killed by the Jewish mob. When they came out, uh, he, came, he didn't understand all that was going on. They got up to a balcony and he said, and no doubt this time he's bleeding, he's bludgeoned, he's been punched and hit and kicked and, and jerked around and... But he says, could I speak to my friends? Could I speak to, not the end, my friends, but to my people? They, had, they hated him. They wanted to, to, to destroy him. And yet, the, by God's grace, he took advantage of an opportunity. And he got their attention. And he shared his story. He shared his testimony about what he was before Jesus what God did for him on the road to Damascus. He shared about the people that were instrumental in helping him grow, Ananias in particular. He told about people and helped them, and he told that God had a calling upon his life. By the way, you know, everybody in here, if you're saved, you should tell your testimony the same way. What you were before Jesus, what God did to bring you to Jesus, the people who have helped you grow in Jesus, and that what God has called you to do, and that is to be faithful to him and share his gospel today. So he told them that, and he told them, part of my calling is to reach the Gentile world. And when he said Gentile, they got fired up because they were radically prejudiced against the Gentile world. They didn't understand God's way. They only got stuck in their own paradigm. And then they began to throw a fit and scream and holler and pull their clothes off and beat up the dust and, and yell and scream. And boy, the, the chief captain didn't know what happened. He wasn't speaking Hebrew. He didn't know Hebrew. And everybody was real quiet until he said one word. And the prejudice brought about great dissent. And they pulled him off. They were going to beat him. And he said, hey, before you beat me, you know I'm a Roman citizen. I got my papers. He said, oh, no, we can't do that. We're not even supposed to arrest you without some sort of proof and, and background, and you're, you're innocent until proven guilty. If you were a regular slave or someone that was a foreigner, we could do this, but you're a Roman citizen. And that rescued him, and it kind of let them treat him with kit gloves going forward because of his Roman. And he used what he had. He used the fact that he knew Greek and Hebrew. He used the fact that he was raised in, in Tarshish and, and trained in Jerusalem. And he had been raised, he told all the people that God had used and the things that God had used his life in. And by the way, that's what we should do. Use whatever God's given you. He even used his Roman citizenship. Now, 
he is kept overnight. And the guy said, I don't know what's going on, but I'll let you go to court tomorrow and you can, they can figure it out. If it's some kind of Jewish thing, then I'll, I'll take you to their tribal, their tribune and let them decide what's going on. That's where we come to chapter 23. The Apostle Paul is now, has been a night in jail. And he doesn't know really what's going on. It doesn't look good. It's a problem. And he comes down, and he's taken down, and he stands in front of a tribune of the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin was a group that he was a part of, no doubt. Many people believe he was a part of that group uh, 20 years prior. 20 years had gone by, and now he's been a faithful servant of Christ for all these years. He has a different high priest. The high priest that he is standing in front is not someone that, uh, that he served under. He might have served with him. But Paul is standing there, and there is a high priest. It doesn't probably look like it was, a, it was a, an emergency assembly. So potentially, they didn't have their way they were set up, maybe because the, the Romans said, you want to talk to them, talk to them tomorrow morning, have everybody here, and we're going to go with it. And so they assembled quickly the next day, and the high priest is there. His name is Ananias, Ananias and he is a foul man. He's obviously got some issues, not only from what his conduct here, but from those who, that wrote about him in that first century say that he was not a good man. He was very biased. He was very profane. He was very uh, impetuous. But he's in charge, and now they, the, the, the chief captain has turned him over them. He's standing there, and here is the group. On the way that worked, there were two, they're all Jewish people, Orthodox Jews, but some of them were Pharisees, which they, the different, and some of them were Sadducees. And the Pharisees believed uh, they were easier to come to know Christ because they believed two things that the Sadducees did not believe. They believed in uh, miracles and they believed uh, in, uh, in the resurrection. The Sadducees, and the reason they were Sadducee, is, I'm just joking about that part right there, is they did not believe in either one of those. They rejected that. They had a real dead religion, but they were Jews, and, and it looked like the Sanhedrin was divided among them. But it's time for court. Court is in session. And he comes in, and, and the Ananias is there. Now keep in mind, there's something we believe that Paul had a problem with, and that was his eyesight. I don't know if this plays into this particular story, but many people believe he would, he would sign his letters with his own hand. But he would, rather, he would normally never write his letters because they believe his eyesight was poor. And remember, when he met Jesus, he was blinded on the road to Damascus. Might have been from that, might have been a genetic thing, but we believe he had bad eyesight. And he may have been the, the thing that he said, Lord, if you could let this be healed in me, I could serve you much better. And the Lord said, you know, I'm not going to heal you, but my grace is sufficient. Some people believe it might have been as I see. I don't know for sure about that. But we do see something here that may be in the case. Because we'll see in chapter 23, verse number 1, would you look at it? And Paul, earnestly beholding uh, the council, said, men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God unto this day. He addressed them, looks like to me, courteously. He said, men that are in this room and, and my brothers, one of the things I'll just say is that everything I'm doing, I'm doing with good conscience before God and before you. Well, that sounds like, that sounds probably good to you and I. We appreciate someone who's, who's coming with good sincerity. However, they weren't expecting him to say that. They expected an apology. They expected something that he would come out. But he just said, look, the only thing he said is, men and brethren, I stand before you with a clean conscience between God and between you. And when that was said, the high priest immediately said something that he was not expecting. And you probably would not expect just opening your mouth for just a few moments in a court of law. Look, if you would please, verse number two. And the high priest, Ananias, commanded them that stood by him to smite him on the mouth. So as soon as he said, I'm living in good conscience between you and, and, the, and, and, and God, the next thing that he heard was the high priest or a man saying, smack that guy right now across his face. And someone turned and smacked him across the face. And of course, I don't know about you, but if you get smacked across the face, you probably have something to say too. 
Well, he had something to say. And you see the humanity in the Apostle Paul. And if he quickly, after his face is stinging, and he is, he's, uh, he's blindsided by this, this physical violence because he just said, I've lived in conscience between God and man. I've got a clean conscience. And then smack that guy. Whack. Look at what's happened. Verse number three. Then said Paul unto him, God shall smite thee, thou whited wall. Sittest thou to judge me after the law and commandest me to be smitten contrary to the law? He said, look, you big hypocrite. You're, you're judging me on one statement and against the law. You're saying I did something wrong and you've done something wrong. I haven't done anything wrong. I've just said I've, I've got a good, clean conscience. And you're calling him to smack, you big hypocrite. And the Bible tells us, verse number four, and they stood by, said, they stood by, revilest thou God's high priest? They said, man, I can't believe you talked to the, to the priest that way. He said, I'm surprised you said that to the priest, so, so uh, accusatory. And this is interesting here. The apostle Paul, look what happens, verse number five. Then said Paul, I wist not, or I didn't know, brethren, that he was the high priest. For it is written, thou shalt not speak evil of the, of the ruler of thy people. He quoted a verse of scripture in Exodus chapter 22. So here with his face red and stinging, and he has... His response was, man, God smites you, you whited wall, you, 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 you sepulcher, you, you hypocrite. Hit me against the law and you're judging me by the law? Come on. And they said, man, you know, he's talking to the high priest. He probably shouldn't talk that way. I can't believe he said that. He goes, oh, I didn't know that he was the high priest. Maybe because he was not in his normal garb. Maybe because Paul didn't know him from 20 years prior, later on in that Sanhedrin. Maybe because Paul didn't see him as well. I don't know why, but it's interesting that Paul, when confronted with something that he did wrong, he could have said, well, you know he smit me. You know what the law says. He hurts me. My face is red and it hurt me. He didn't do that. He said, oh, man, I didn't know he was a high priest. I'm sorry. God tells me I'm not supposed to speak evil against the ruler of your people. You know, that's a good thing for all of us to learn. You know, someone said a good Christians, they're, number one, they're concentrated on doing and committed to do what is right. Not what's easy, not what's convenient, not what's comfortable, but what is the right thing to do. Number two, good Christians are quick to confess and repent of things they do that are wrong. Quick. I think it's very important that whenever I'm faced with a confrontation or something I did wrong, whether it be the Holy Spirit on the inside or another brother who rebukes me on the outside, how do you handle reproof? The Bible says reprove not a scorner. Why? Because he'll hate you. You reprove somebody who is a scorner, and they'll get mad at the person who reproves them. But you reprove a wise man, and he will love you. And you think quickly, you see the Apostle Paul stinging physically from the smack he received and the rejection he received when he did nothing wrong. And by the way, one thing I think we've got to learn, learn about life is life is not always fair. If you're looking for a fair life, you're going, to, you're going to be struggling the rest of your life. Especially in this time of life, and you don't have all the criteria. Paul didn't know either, but here he finds that he is being smacked around. He gets confronted because the person he, he didn't, he heard the voice say, hit that guy. He got hit, and he said, well, God smite you, you whited wall. And he said, that's the high priest that said that. He goes, I didn't know that. I know I'm not supposed to speak against the high priest the ruler of God, the God, the one that God put there. By the way, God usually sides with authority. Even a police officer, a government official, I find we ought to be very careful our criticism of God's men, God's people, and God's uh, servants, even in the, in the public uh, political setting. Amen. One of the things that drive me crazy, and I, I, don't, I disagree with much of what happens to the political, but I'm telling you, I'm, I'm just not really interested in someone... Um, uh, speaking unkindly of, of our leaders. I don't think you should. I think it's a, direct, uh, it's a direct opposition to what God wants. And we see that even right here. You may not agree with them. You don't have to agree with them. But you can be respectful. You can reverence them. And I think it's very important that God's telling us, he's showing us that right here in this passage of Scripture. Many of us were too proud to even accept what I just said. Now, I'm not mad at anybody, but some of you got issues. 
You're too proud to even, and you can look in the scriptures and you find it. Go, go ahead and read 1 Peter chapter 2. Read it and tell me what you think about God's opinion. All through the Bible. Here's a guy who's being treated like trash. He said, oh, you know what? I know what the Bible says. Exodus 22, 6 says, I'm not supposed to speak evil against people. I didn't know he was the high priest. I'm sorry. But then the Bible says he does something very unique. He knows he's not going to get a fair trial. And he says, you know what? He, he realizes the Sanhedrin is made up of half Sadducees, half Pharisees. Maybe they dress differently. Maybe he recognized a few of them. I don't know. But he comes out with something that is very unique, and it really saves his bacon. Let's look at it. Can we please look at you, please, verse number six. But when Paul perceived that the one part was Sadducees and the other part was Pharisee, he cried out into the council, men and brethren, I am a Pharisee and the son of a Pharisee, and of the hope of the resurrection of the dead am I called into question. One of the biggest issues, he said, look, guys, knowing that has half of the, the half over here are Democrats and the others are Republicans. He knows they're politically divided here. They have strong opinions on both sides, but they're in the same house. He says, look, guys, I am a Pharisee, and I was born in the house of a Pharisee. And one of the reasons I'm here is because I believe that someone was dead rose again. And I think I'm going to rise again one day, too. I believe in the resurrection. And that's the real issue that why I'm here in this courthouse. Well, that really stirred it up because now half of the room are Pharisees and they're like saying, well, he's a good guy. I love that guy. You know, he's, he's one of us. I believe in the resurrection too. And of course, the Pharisees or the Sadducees, they're all fired up. They're like, you know, we don't believe in that. And they get even angrier. And the, the Pharisees for that moment of time are having a little bit of a change of heart because it's not about Paul now. It's about an issue. Look at the next verse, if we can, please. Verse number seven. And when he had said so, there arose a dissension, an argument between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the multitude was divided. They had there, it, it drew a line real quickly. For the Sadducees say there's no resurrection, neither angel nor spirit. And Paul had already told him he had been spoken to by a messenger of God, which is the Lord Jesus Christ that appeared to him. And, and Ananias had come, and all these things, and, his, and the miracle of his sight coming back, all these things he had told about the miraculous. And he spoke of the resurrection of Christ. Verse number 9, And there rose a great cry, and the scribes of the Pharisees rose apart, rose and strove, saying, We find no evil with this man. For if a spirit or an angel has spoken to him, let us not fight against God. He said, man, if he had a miracle going, we'll accept it. <laughs> Let's don't argue with God. That's what God gave to him. So now the scribes are getting on, jumping on his side. Look at verse number 10. And when there arose a great dissension, dissension, the chief captain, fearing that Paul should have been pulled in pieces of them, commanded the soldiers to go down and take him by force and among them and bring him into the castle. So, he, so the chief captain watching him begins to see that the, the, the crowd's getting really hostile. And he sees that uh, whatever's happened in the Hebrew tongue, he doesn't understand it, but he knows it's not good. He tells his police captain, get down there and get that guy out of here. This is a kangaroo court, and it's not going to work, and nothing's, and nothing's being solved here except for getting more people excited. Get him out. And they brought him to the castle again. This is where God meets with Paul for the fourth time that we know personally. We know he met him on the road to Damascus. We know he spent time with him in the, book, in, the, in the area of Arabia. That would be a second time where he spent long times with him, according to the book of Galatians. Galatia, Galatians. But now we find that Paul, God has appeared to him at Corinth when he was really low. And he's appeared with him in chapter uh, 20, 22, 21. And now he appears to him in chapter 23. This is a beautiful testimony. I want you to look at it, if you would, please. We're looking at verse number 11. Can you read it out loud with me, everybody, would you please? And the night following, the Lord stood by him. So must thou bear witness also. I don't know exactly where Paul was at this time. I would imagine he's pretty discouraged. Here he had just, he had expectations. He was going to bring these seven men, these Gentile believers whose lives had been radically changed by the gospel. Each of them had offerings to offer the local church. 
And now he is, it just didn't turn out well. It didn't turn out well, and he always had in his heart, you can see this as you read the book of Romans, which I believe he had already written. He, he had written the book of Romans, and he wanted to get to Rome. He wanted to minister to them. He wanted to impart to them more information. And the people in Rome had been saved through his missionary work. And they were leading people to Christ in Rome, and he wanted to get there. You can read that in Romans chapter number 1. He was passionate about getting there. And now it looks like all of his dreams are gone. Here he is in a, a white, dirty uh, clothes. He's bald-headed, potentially. He's got beats and bruises all over him. He's been pulled and rescued now twice. And he sits by himself in the castle in Jerusalem at the helm of, of Claudius Lysias, the chief captain. And he probably is in a low place. But aren't you glad the Lord comes to be with him? And the Bible says the Lord came. And he said, Paul, be of good cheer. Be of good cheer. And he says, you know what? You're going to speak in Rome. You're going to go to Rome. I'm going to take care of you. And he knew whatever happened that time, and that shipwreck that he would have later, he knew, I'm going to Rome. He had God's word on it. He said, You're gonna, I'm going to let you go to Rome. And it comforted Paul, and I think it gave him a trajectory and confidence that God was going to use him in a wonderful way. There are so many things about the story, and I wish to goodness I had another 30 minutes, and I don't think I would do the time justly. But there's a couple things I want you to come away today with the message today. Number one, I want you to know that understand that problems will come to active servants of Christ. Sometimes we think, you know, if you're really living for the Lord, then you're going to have a great life. You won't have any problems. It's not true. I don't think you could find a man more committed to Christ than Apostle Paul, and he was in it over his nose. It was troubling. He was treated unjustly, joined the club. Things weren't fair. Here, where's the local church here? You'd think maybe someone would come down and, and visit him and minister him. They, they just kind of distance themselves from him. Probably all the guys, the Gentile believers, they, they probably meandered out of Jerusalem pretty quick. Or they were going to be hurt. Here he is by himself. And you know, sometimes difficult things come to every person's life. Who are especially those involved in the work of the Lord. So number two, I think we do need to learn to submit and be respectful of leadership in our life, regardless of our opinions, regardless of how we're treated. I think we have a lesson here that can be helpful to us here. I think also wisdom and discernment are needed in pressure situations. What's he going to do? He's not going to get a fair trial, but he does something Somewhat, uh, somewhat carnal, maybe. <laughs> Just said, you know what? I'm a Pharisee. My dad was a Pharisee, and I believe in the resurrection, and divided an audience. But it's kind of neat to me to see the providence of God showing up. God rescuing him, and then God ministering to him. What happens when God meets with you? How many would say, Pastor, I'm not a spiritual giant, but I think there's been seasons of my life when God met with me. I was low, and he met with me. How many would say, I remember a time like that? I can stand here today and tell you things. Brother Eddie was telling me something the other day about that text he got. He said, Pastor, I was just, I was just done. I was just done. I was in a very low place. And I said, to, I said I'm done. I'm not, I'm not going to continue. And then a text came across his phone from someone who loved him, who had no idea what he was going through, and said, it's no time to quit. It's okay to wait. And he's like, how would he know? And he fell to his feet and asked, fell to his knees and asked God, Lord, help me keep going. How many, how many have something like that happen to you someday where God met with you? You know, when God meets with us, number one, fear is turned to cheer. He was known out low. And, and he said, Lord, he said to him, be of good cheer, Paul. I think another thing that happens to us in times when God meets with us, direction is given. At low times of your life, you want, to, you want God to meet with you. Don't run away from church. Goodness, don't do that. 
Don't start, stop attending your Sunday school. Go to your Sunday school class. Don't stop reading your Bible. Don't let an offense cause you to get away. You need God to meet with you. Because your fear and your frustrations can be turned to cheer. Number two, you need direction for your future. And God gave him direction. Say, hey, you're going to go to Rome. How about that? I've always wanted to go to Rome. That's what I wanted to do. I've got a group of people. I want to minister to them. I want to impart even more of the ministry of Christ to them. God gives us directions in low times of our life if we'll let God visit with us. I think another thing that he does, he provides personal care and touch to us. I never remember looking out of a plane after I heard that my dad had gone to cardiac arrest. I was 26 years old. I just finished my grandfather's funeral. The phone rang. We came in, and my brother said, John, get to Knoxville right away. Dad's gone into cardiac arrest. And I was with my mom and my two brothers, and we found, found tickets and flew through the night from San Angeles, Texas, to Dallas-Fort Worth, and then on to, to Knoxville to get there in the, in, the, in the wee hours of the morning. And I remember just bawling. I mean, I knew my dad wasn't, he was not going to live forever, but I just felt like it wasn't time for him to go. And I would never get the chance to communicate with my dad. He had gone to cardiac arrest and would stay there for another 9, 10, 11 days on life support. But boy, I remember looking out the, road, looking out the window and just bawling. I had the guy next to me and said, man, you're going to be okay? I said, yeah, I'm okay. Looking out at the lights of the city of Dallas and realizing, you know, I don't know if my dad's going to be alive when I ever land. But boy, I, I felt like the Lord just pulled up and got in the seat belt beside me. He said, John, we're going to be okay. I'm going to help you. And he gives us his personal touch. And then he keeps us focused on the gospel. And I want all of us to have that. I want you to have the touch of God upon you, and you want that for me too, I'm sure. In low times of life, you need that. Don't expect life to be fair. It's not going to be. There are a lot more questions than answers sometimes. But you'll find that God will meet you. Somewhere in the shadows, you'll find Jesus. Let's pray together, can we please?